Hello everyone. So we'll give it a few moments. If you're there, make sure you say hi. Ask lots of questions, although I have a lot to cover, so jump in, jump on in. All right, hey everyone, got a couple people. Maybe go tell your friends, we'll get a couple more. We'll have some fun talking about swimming. All right. One more minute. Hey, Margaret, Sam, thanks for joining in summer. All right. Well, early bird catches the worm, so you get to hear the whole talk. Can't talk about people who aren't here yet. Uh, so it's Coach Craig from Endurance Swimming, websites enduranceswimming.com or liquidtry.com. Uh, I am here to talk to you today about all things swimming. Uh, so let's kind of jump in. Uh, obviously, a lot of us have been on a forced hiatus due to the pandemic uh, and social distancing and other unfortunate events. Um, I as well have have had to had to deal with that. So obviously, our training is our swim training is taking a hit with pools being closed and beaches. Not really being closed, just being too cold up until like the last week or two. Um, so today I'm going to focus on what to do when getting back in after a long break. Uh, and then we'll go into some safety tips, followed by uh, how to actually get back into real training safely to prevent injury. Um, maybe talk a little some open water sighting, open water skills. And then uh, I know we started with a few questions, so if you have questions, put them into the comments and I will try to answer them. Um, and definitely ask questions on the fly so that I can answer them in a conversation type fashion. Um, I like to talk, but I usually like to have a conversation versus talk at a camera, so please definitely ask questions. Uh, so first topic um, I want to talk about is We've been out of the water for a while, and some of us may have not been in the pool since last season because you probably took the you took some time off after race season. Maybe you didn't get into it fully until February, and then next thing you know, the pools are closed in March. So we've had a pretty pretty long break. Um, so with most pools being closed, some are opening slowly, but chances are most of you want to get get going again, um, we're all hitting the open water. So, you know, one of the things, if if your gear has been sitting in storage or on a hook in your garage or somewhere, um, one of the first things you're gonna wanna do is you wanna check all your gear first. So you get your wetsuit, your neoprene caps, booties, gloves, goggles, get everything, check it, all right, with the wetsuit, Definitely get it a little wet before putting it on. This will help prevent uh, cracking if it started to to dry out a bit during, um, I guess, the fall and winter and now spring. Uh, so get it wet, try it on, look for holes, um, all that kind of stuff. Just general quick wetsuit check. Um, the water by me, I'm in, I swim out of Swampscott, so North Shore area. The Cape is probably a little warmer, but the water, when I swam, I swam two days ago. No, I swam yesterday. I swam yesterday. It was 48 degrees. Yeah, the ocean was 48 degrees. So some of you may be trying to swim in some really cold water. So uh, with that being said, make sure you have the booties and the gloves and the neoprene caps uh, and wear the wetsuit if you're not used to cold like that. Um, and then the other thing you're going to want to check for is your goggles. Um, you're generally... I recommend having three pairs. Uh, you have different conditions, which you'll want different goggles for. Um, generally not different model of goggles, just a different lens. So if you're going to be doing a swim in overcast or dark, no real sun, I recommend going with the clear lenses. If you are, <laughs> yeah, I know Andy, 48's not happening for most people, but uh, 
Unfortunately, with pools not open, people are may take risks. I've been swimming all winter, so we're going to get into acclimation a bit too if you do want to venture out into the very cold waters. Uh, but back to goggles, we have um, your clear goggle for your overcast day. For your slightly sunny day, if it has a little glare, you're going to want like a smoke or a tinted goggle. And then you're going to want uh, polarized for those or mirrored goggles for those really, really sunny days. Uh, when you find a pair or style of goggles that work, just stick with it. Um, you don't need a different goggle, like different style for each. Uh, get the same style if it works for you because usually it takes a while to find goggles that fit your face properly um, so that you're comfortable and they're not leaking. And um, If you do triathlon, I know this sounds bad, but you want goggles that you can kind of take a hit in just because when you are in a group of a thousand people or however many, if you're doing Ironman or half Ironman and they just say, ready, go, um, you're going to get hit. Uh, I, I will wear Swedish goggles in the pool, which have no padding and they just kind of sink right into the eye sockets. I don't want to get hit in the face with those on. Uh, it will hurt. Uh, for my open water goggle, I use... Um, uh, tear nest pro that's what works for my face i like it it allows for a little bit of swelling from the from the salt and those are very soft so if i do accidentally get a hand to the face or a foot to the face um i don't have to worry it doesn't i mean it doesn't feel good but it, the goggles nothing it, nothing on the goggles gonna hurt me so you're gonna want to find that goggle that's comfortable for you uh and stick to it um they all leak. They all fog. There's nothing you can really do about it. You can spit in them and use a spray, but that's about it. Um, additionally, make sure you have your body glide. I know we've all forgotten it, and then we have like the wetsuit rash on the neck or the wetsuit hickey or like under the armpit cuts that last forever, uh, and they're super painful. That is definitely uncomfortable and can be avoided with body glide. Um, that's what I like to use, but I've seen people use Pam, like the cooking spray. I've seen Vaseline. I don't love Vaseline because it gets everywhere. And then if it's on your hand and then you touch the inside of your goggles, the outside of your goggles, you're not going to see anything. So, um, have your body glide. And then for a lot of us in the Massachusetts area, there's a, especially around now, if you're in the Cape where a lot of you are probably, um, swimming or if you're on the North Shore, there's a lot of boat traffic, whether it's kayaks, stand-up paddle boards, fishing boats, sailboats. Um, I always highly recommend having a colorful buoy or something um, so that boats can see you easier. Like a bright colored cap is great, but a boat can see a buoy from far away. I use the New Wave Swim Buoy, but they're all great. I mean, they're comfortable. The only time you have to be careful is if there's big swell. Um, the buoy can get caught in the waves and pull you down. So just be cognizant of that. It, if you're nervous, maybe go in holding it, not having it clipped to you. But um, a lot of the locations I personally swim at are not huge swells. So uh, if you're in a lake or a pond, you definitely don't really have to worry about that. Um, but it is something to consider if you are newer to open water swimming. It's a great thing to have uh, for for safety, but there are times when you may want to get in with it in a, in a, in a different way than wearing it. Um, so you go through your checklist, you make sure you have everything. You make sure everything fits good. You make sure everything's comfortable. I mean, if it's been sitting in a closet for a year, you might need to buy a new one. I mean, you leave your goggles out in, the, in a car for a year. If they've been in the sun on a few hot days, they start to melt. You go to put it on and it just breaks. Um, so that's kind of the gear checklist, you know, have all that stuff, be comfortable in it, uh, especially if you're getting into the ocean now or lakes now where it's a still on the colder side, like mid fifties. Um, it's more comfortable in a wetsuit, but it's, it's still cold if you're not used to it. And the last thing you want to have is a gear malfunction while you're trying to get back into swimming. Um, so that's gear. Does anyone have any gear questions? You find gear, stuff you like, stuff you don't like, using gear that I'm not mentioning, uh, add it in the comments um, for your fellow triathletes to, to see. Uh, another thing that I actually do like to use, not necessarily in races, um, but when I'm training in colder water, I do actually wear, I wear uh, earplugs. And I'll generally wear three caps for really cold swims. So if it's if you tend to get that ice cream headache, one thing you can do is you can get 
two silicone caps and a neoprene cap and ear plugs. Uh, ear plugs go in, you put one silicone cap on, then you put the neoprene cap, and then you put your brightly colored silo uh, a third, the second sil brightly colored silicone cap over the neoprene cap. Um, basically, like you won't get the ice cream headache. There's so much protection, especially with the ear plugs in, where there's no cold water going into the ears. Um, that's been really helpful for me. Um, I've been doing a lot of winter swimming the past year, so I've been getting in no wetsuit um, for the past several months. Um, and some days I don't, you know, I can get away with one cap and any earplugs. Other days I just am not feeling it and I need to cover up. So the silicone cap, neoprene cap, silicone cap with the earplugs, your head will not be cold. Like it won't be cold. You won't have the ice cream headache or, or that freezing feeling. Uh, so if you tend to get that headache, especially in warmer waters, like in the 60s, this is something you can try. You can also try doubling up on caps. So you can just do two silicone caps if you don't have the neoprene cap. Um, you can, you know, play around and see what you like. But that's my spiel on gear. So we've got our stuff on. But um, I, I kind of live by this rule. Um, I call it a, it's one of the big safety things. Uh, it's I leave my ego on shore. Uh, and the reason for this is, you know, we're all excited. We've all taken a long break. We want to get back in the water. And with that, bad things can happen. Like if you're not in the most fit swim shape or the water's a little colder than you anticipated. So when I say leave your ego on shore, I mean just that. Like don't go into your first swim or your first few swims of the year with any goals. Like don't go and say, I need to hit 2,000 yards or I need to be in for 30 minutes. Like that should be that shouldn't be a thought in your head. Uh, also, don't give in to peer pressure. Um, I've been I've been on both sides of it, where like I try to get my friends to go with me, and then I have friends who try to get me to go with them. Um, you know, you have to look at the conditions and see what's going on, and see if you're comfortable with it, because the open water is not really a place you want to be messing around with. Um, so especially in colder water, you don't want to have those, those goals or have that ego of like, oh, I'm tough. I'm, I'm, I'm mentally tough. I can handle the cold. The reality is hypothermia. It's a physical thing. Like once it sets in, if you're not used to it, um, and you never really get used to hypothermia, it's just how bad or how fast it sets in, you're in trouble. And if you're on the middle of the lake or in the middle of the ocean or far from shore, you push your limits, you're going to find out they push back, unfortunately. So you do want to, you, you want to just kind of have fun and be happy that you're getting in the first few swims of the year. Um, play it, play it day by play, play it day by day. Um, some days you'll go and you'll feel great and you'll, you'll bust out an hour. Other days, something will just feel off. Call it a day. If something's off, it, there's too many things that could go wrong. Um, it's not worth it. So that's that's the big thing. Uh, along with the safety, wear your swim buoy. Uh, I don't care if you're in a lake or ocean, wherever. The swim buoy is great because if you have a swim a swim buddy swimming with you, you have someone in a watercraft, you have someone walking on land spotting you, they can see you really easily with the buoy. Uh, whether there's glare coming off the sun, like I've I've gone to the beach spotting swimmers before, and they don't have a buoy, and I lose them in the glare. Like, cause you have the sun and then you have a, you know, bouncing off the surface and you lose them for a minute and you start panicking, where'd they go? Um, when they have a buoy, that doesn't happen. So I highly recommend for safety purposes, wear your buoy. It's, I mean, it, it's stupid not to, to be honest, like, just to be perfectly honest in this area where there's so much boat traffic, you can prevent so many problems by wearing a buoy. Um, so have your buoy, if it's possible, swim parallel to shore. Um, there's no reason to go out into, I'm glad Amy has her buoy. It's smart, you should never swim without it. Um, even if you're in waist deep water, wear it because you don't know what's gonna happen. Uh, but anyway, so swim parallel to shore if you can. There's no reason to swim out to sea. There's no reason to swim to the middle of the lake unless there really is no shoreline and you have to do that. There's a lot of reasons for that. Um, Mainly, if there's an emergency and you're in the middle of the lake, no one's getting to you quickly unless you have a kayaker right next to you. And if you're in the middle of the lake with a swim buddy, now, your swim buddy now has to tow you all the way in. So if it took you 20 minutes to get to the middle of the lake, 
if something happens to you and you can't swim and then you have your swim buddy trying to tow you, it took you 20 minutes of swimming at 80% of max effort. Now you have one person carrying two people and they're tired. I mean, I'll let you do the math, but it's, uh, it's not great. You know, I, I don't swim out to the middle of the ocean, even with a kayak. I always hug the shoreline. I'm not, I don't need to be a hero. I know I can swim. You know you can swim. You do the training. I like to get out past the breakers if there's big swell, but if it's quiet, calm and quiet, I'm going to swim in about waist to chest deep water, uh, especially when it's cold, especially early on in the season. If you, um, if you're cold, like if you're cold and you need to get out, you start shivering and you need to get out and you got to swim two, 300 yards in, that's a long time when you're starting to get hypothermia setting in. Uh, even if you're not, that's a long time to get hypothermia. Like that's a long time to get back to shore. So it's a lot easier if your exit strategy is stand up and walk out. Like that's easier. That's a lot easier in an emergency. Or if you're if something happens to you and you lose consciousness, your buddy can pull you out a lot easier from chest deep or waist deep than they can from 300 yards offshore. Uh, additionally, if you have a spotter, they can run in. They don't need to be a good swimmer. They can run in and pull you out. So for safety purposes, I always recommend swimming parallel to shore. I personally swim parallel to shore unless I'm doing a channel swim, in which case there's a boat right next to me. So if there's a problem, they can pull me out. Uh, so don't be a hero. You're not cool because you can swim out to the middle of the lake because you still have to get back. And then finally, this is the number one rule I never violate. Never swim alone. Like, never. There are, like... It's not worth it. I've had, and it can be an inconvenient, an inconvenience when you show up to swim and your buddy bails on you or you don't have a spotter and then you don't have your workout in. Missing a swim is not the end of the world. Dying is the end of your world and maybe your family's too. So there's no reason to swim alone ever. If, if, like, if you can avoid it, I, I never recommend swimming alone. Uh, even the best swimmers have had incidences. Look at Fran Crippen. He wasn't swimming alone and he had a problem. He was one of the best swimmers in the world. So again, I don't care if you swam in high school and college and you've swimming for 20 years. It does not matter. Stuff happens if you have someone there, whether it's a watercraft, it's a swim buddy, it's a spotter, they will all help you get through an emergency if there is one. Hopefully there never is one, but Never say never. Additionally, if you swim where there's lifeguards, um, I highly recommend telling the lifeguard what you're up to for two reasons. One is they just go up to the lifeguard. They, they usually are happy about it. You go up to the lifeguard and you say, uh, hey, I'm going to be swimming out by the buoys. I'm probably going to be doing a quarter mile, whatever it is. Um, they're appreciative for two reasons. One, they're not going to go in if you're waiting or you look like you're struggling. You might just not be a pretty swimmer. So one, they're not going to run in and get you. And two, they'll keep an eye on you. So if something does look off, they will run in and get you. But if they don't know you, if they don't know what's going on, you're going to take resources away from people who are on shore. So if there's a lifeguard, tell them because it keeps you safe, keeps other people on the beach safe. And it keeps, um, it, 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 it basically is just another safety net for you. So, uh, those are kind of the, this, the major safety pieces I like to follow. And I, I'm sure some of you list, you know, I'm reading the comments. Some of you violate the rules. Some of you don't, uh, again, like sometimes you, you, you don't have the option and that's not true. You always have the choice. You can always say, I'm not swimming. I've had, like I said, like the swimming is the, I don't do triathlon anymore. I only swim. I train for channel swim. So when I miss a swim, it's a big deal for me, but if my, my buddy gets sick or someone can't come and walk, walk on shore with me, I just will, I'll call it a day and I'll find another way to get it in. I'll make it up later in the week. I'll get my workout in. It just might not be that swim at that time. Uh, and you have to be flexible. I mean, when you go biking or running, it's, it's pretty consistent, especially if like you're on a treadmill or you're on your trainer, like you, you can do it anywhere. You get, you get tired, you can slow down, you can get off, you can walk in the ocean. Even, even if you're swimming, in waist deep water, if stuff happens, you know, you, you don't know what's going to happen. You could turn your head, a wave hits you, you get water in, you aspirate, you start choking, you get more water in. So that can happen in two feet of water. So your, your best bet is to just call, just, just don't go if you don't have someone with you. And I can't, I can't 
state that enough. That is like my number one rule. And, you know, some of you know me, some of you don't know me, but I'm all about getting my swimming. I, I personally have done the training, so I don't care about the cold, but I have called swims because I haven't felt right. Where I get in, I'm like, oh, this isn't happening today. Something's off and I get out. So I think that's my number one. If you get nothing out of this talk, it's never swim alone and leave your ego on shore. That's it. Um, okay, so we're now walking up to the water, right? We've got our gear. We know our ego has been left behind. We have our swim buddy, our spotter. We have our buoy. We're ready to go. Uh, a lot of you, again, have not been training for, I don't know, at least two months, three months. But um, you want to start slow. And that doesn't mean, like, you have to start swimming slow. It means start slow. If you haven't been in the water in a while, wait. Just get in. Wade, right? You know, get in. Go to your waist. You're probably in a wetsuit. Maybe you have booties on. Maybe you don't. Get comfortable. Splash some water in your face, behind your neck. Just get comfortable in the water remember what it feels like all the fun feels and the sounds i mean that's all part of it you want to enjoy the whole experience not just i gotta get in and get my swim you want to enjoy it try to be happier in nature um so splash around a bit once you feel comfortable duck down go to your neck uh if you're feeling comfortable you can you know pull the pull the wetsuit get a little water in the wetsuit basically we're doing this to avoid um that shock response if the water is 55 that's that's cold for just about everyone so you don't want to have that shock response where you you open it and well you don't want to jump in and have that shock response so if i go running in like a maniac I'm like oh my god the water i haven't seen you in so long i'm so excited and you sprint in and you dive and you dive forward and then next thing you know the water hits your face and then everything's like you have the wind knocked out of you the first thing you want to do is gasp right well what happens if you're not you don't come up fast enough or you're gasping as you're coming up. You start aspirating water and then we're in a bad situation. So you go in, go down to your neck, get a little water in, let that shock response kind of wear off, feel good. Uh, once you feel good, bob up and down, get underwater, feel pretty good. At that point, if everything's good, start swimming. Don't swim like a maniac. If you have that headache, maybe you don't have a bunch of caps or the neoprene, if you get that ice cream headache, just start swimming. You can start with breaststroke, sculling. Just get moving forward. Nice light kick. Put your face in. Pick it up. Put your face in. Pick it up. And eventually the ice cream headache goes away. It's it's a pain for two minutes and it really does. It sucks. Um, but once it goes away, you're fine. If you're in 55 and you're in a, wet, a full sleeve wetsuit without gloves and, and booties, you're You'll be fine. You might get cold after, you know, 40, 30, 45, an hour, depending on how much you've been in the water, how how fast your turnover is. There's all these things that you can do to kind of get the 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 heat going, if you will. Um, but your first few swims shouldn't be about that. It's just getting comfortable. Just be happy you got out. You got like 30 minutes in and you feel good. Uh, if you only get 15 minutes in, that's great too. But start slow. Again, throw out any expectation. It's just about getting in that first day. Um, with regard to getting in now, I mean, like I said, I, I don't know why the water's 48 right now. I was in, yesterday it was 48. I was in three days ago, it was 62. I was in a week before that, it was 50. So I don't know what's going on. Um, but acclimating to the cold is, it's real. Like you should be doing it if you're not used to cold water but you want to get in and start swimming, I am not going to tell you to not go in because you probably will, right? But you're all type A. You want to get your workouts in. But um, just be safe. Take your time. Wade, leave your expectations. Like, even if you just get in the water and sit in, you know, waist-deep, chest-deep water with your hands like this because they're too cold, then that's fine. Um, one other thing you should know is know the signs of hypothermia. Like, there's only a few of them that you really need to know that mean, okay, get out now or, um, or get out in a bit. You know, one of the things, if you're shivering in the water, get out now. If you're cold, maybe you have a few more minutes, but start thinking about getting out. If you have like a claw, all right, this happens. This is like a later stage. Basically, if you lose function of your hands or anything, really, um, this is bad. Okay. You, you need to, you're not, not you're not going to die. Okay. Yeah. If you try to tough it out, 
I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> but if you get the claw, get out. Okay. What happens is when I, that's the first time when I start seeing that, I know I only have like maybe a minute or two left, but that's because I've been doing it all winter long. Um, basically, if you're trying to do this, but this is all that will happen or this is all that will happen, that means you need to get out. Um, I'll get to the drills, Karen, in one second. So that's shivering's bad. Being cold isn't bad. Just get out soon. Claw is bad. Not feeling your feet. That's normal. That's a normal response to cold, uh, even in the booties. It's a pain and it's uncomfortable, but it's not the end of the world. If your stroke rate slows way down, get out. That's a bad sign. And then if you're thinking slow, get out. So if you know those few tips, you're generally going to be fine. And listen to your body. Don't say, oh, I'm tough. I can handle a few more minutes. If you're thinking slow or your stroke rate went from 70 strokes per minute down to 50, your body's starting to kind of shut down on you. So it's time to leave and call it a day. Um, <clears throat> so acclimation is basically just getting in slow, building up over time. So if your first session is in 50 degree water and it only lasts five minutes, great. Next time you go, it's going to feel that much better. And then a little bit better, then a little bit better. And eventually the water will be warm enough or you'll be used to the water enough that you're getting full sessions in. But listen to your body. Just because it's your 15th time in doesn't mean you should stay in for an hour if you, something feels off or you have one of these signs. If you're a little dehydrated, hypothermia might creep in faster. You know, if you didn't sleep well, if you're stressed, there's all these things that um, you might that might cause things to happen to kind of get you into a downward spiral. So don't be afraid to call a swim early if it doesn't feel right. I mean, the name of the game is having fun and being safe. And when you can do those two things, you're going to get better as a swimmer. You're going to enjoy the open water that much more. All right. So Karen had a question about besides straight swimming in open water, what drills can we do since all the pools are closed? So depends where you swim. Um, I would say swim focus drills more than kicking focus drills are going to be better. But if you're swimming in a lake where there's no current, there's no wind, you can do just about every, any drill in the open water that you do in the pool. All right. So you can do catch up drill. You can do, um, you know, you can do the stop, stop switch. You can do, I don't know. I don't know what drills, you know, I can label a billion of them, but you can do most of those. The kicking drills are going to be a little harder where you're just, you know, arms are by the side, kicking, picking the head up or kicking on the, you know, finding your sweet spot. If it's a lake, no wind, you can do it. You can do all of them and there's no reason not to. If it is the ocean and there's current and there's wind and it's not glassy, you can do catch up. You can do drills where you're focusing on your technique, uh, like your, your pull technique. It's going to be hard to, if, unless you have a super powerful kick, it's going to be really, really hard to just do straight kicking drills. Um, I would use the first couple weeks back, all right? And that was, I think, one of the questions from the beginning as we started, or as we, I'm going to start talking more about the training. Um, someone asked, do, 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 do. okay, what's a good progression to build back up? Um, because we have not been swimming in pools. So do we start with 20 minutes easy? Do we build up in the water first? And then intensity. So... <clears throat> It depends, right? It depends where you left off, where you're picking up, how what your swim background is. I'm not going to say you should go in and do 20 minutes if you've never swum more than 10 minutes. I'm not going to say, oh, only do 20 minutes if you were doing three hours at a time before. So it really depends. But approach, now that there's no real tries or there's very few tries and things have got pushed way out, you have time, okay? So approach this time as if it is you, as if it's your your preseason or your base phase, right? Take the next two three weeks, just get comfortable, get back in, swim swim, focus on technique, just feel comfortable. Don't push the pace, don't push effort too much. Like I wouldn't go more. Like I'd max out at eighty percent of max effort ever, okay? Um, Oh, you guys have sharks. We don't have those because the water is too cold by us. Uh, we also, there's shark bands, whether you believe in them or not. Some people like that. Um, maybe you could take the wetsuit off for sharks. They, they, they won't think you're seals as much. I don't know. Don't swim with their seals. 
but uh, yeah, so fresh water, then you can do all the drills. Um, but getting back to how to build up. So I say just get in, swim until you feel, swim and feel good. So if it's 20 minutes, great. You know, if it's 30 minutes, great. Just swim until you, swim and feel good. And that's it. The first couple weeks, focus on technique, focus on feeling good. Just build up the base. There's no reason to be pushing hard. <clears throat> I, I don't know when some of your first races are, but if you don't have races, use this time to get really good at swimming. You don't need to be super fast. Get the technique down. Get super comfortable in the open water. Work on your open water skills. So sighting, turns, drafting. Um, I'll put a link in the comments, Kathleen, about the shark bands. So just so you guys can see it. Um, I've used them before. They're kind of cool. Whether they work or not, I didn't get eaten, so they work for me. <laughs> um, but they're called shark bands. Uh, there you go. You can look it up. Um, but yeah, as far as getting in goes, it, it it really just depends on where you left off and how you feel. But focus on the technique. Focus on fingertip entry, high elbow under the water. Um, but open water stroke is different than pool stroke. So that's one thing is as a, as a swim coach that I'm always working with is when we swim pool, our stroke is different than open water. And there's a few reasons for it. Um, mainly... Yes, headstrong too. <laughs> uh, mainly, the um, the open water is less, when you pull, the water is aerated, which means it's less dense than pool water because the sediment, it's different properties, than, you know, especially salt versus fresh water. There's some different properties. You have your wetsuit on, water breaks differently, the wind's breaking the water, so your stroke rate, rate may be higher. Uh, if there's swell, you're going to not necessarily go with a high elbow recovery as much as you would maybe kind of bending the elbow up so that your hand goes over any chop or swell. You might do less straight arm. Um, so the style is different. The stroke rate is going to be different too. You might be doing, if you're in the pool doing 30 strokes per minute, you might be doing 40 strokes per minute in the open water to make up for the fact that you have to spin a little bit more so you can essentially go the same distance because the water is less dense when you're in a salt water, fresh water environment where there's wind and chop and currents. Um, so that's one thing to consider. But as far as the progression and the buildup goes, start where you feel good. And then after two, if you feel good after two weeks, your shoulders feel good, your technique feels good, then work your way, start adding intensity back in that you can do. Um, I'll do like a fart lick swim that I like to do. I'll do 30 minutes and it will be, 30 strokes hard, 30 strokes easy. And your heart rate's going to be all over the place. And if you're doing those 30 strokes hard, you're, you're working. And that's one great way to do intensity. Um, so fart licks are great. You can do half mile efforts, quarter mile efforts. If you have your watch, you can do 100 yards. You can just do it by strokes. But because you don't necessarily need to be super fast right now, since there's no races, I would probably consider thinking more about the technique what feels good, getting comfortable. And maybe you use this summer to work up to bigger distances like that you haven't done before. So maybe you've been training to only do 2,000 yards. Maybe you use the summer where there's no races. If swimming's not your strong suit, make it your strong suit. Make the time that you, like use your time, right? You can bike and run year round, but you can't open water year round. So why not get really, really good? Because if you gain that confidence now, that doesn't go away. You know, next summer you'll be like, oh, I was crushing it last summer. You'll be faster for it. Your confidence will be up. You know you can swim, and you know you can swim in anything. So um, you might say, okay, I, I have a goal of swimming a 10K this year. And it sounds crazy now, but it's June. You want to build up to a 10K if you're swimming two or 3,000 yards now. To build up to a 10K over the next three or four months, it's a very safe way to do it. And it's a crazy – it's a big goal. Like, it's six miles of swimming. Probably something you never thought you could do, or maybe you're new to swimming and you want to build up to a 5K. Even that is like three miles of swimming. I mean, that you can do any Ironman if you can do 5K, right? You can do any a lot of swims if you can do 10K. You can push that much harder if you know you can do a 10K. If you're doing an Ironman swimming, like, oh, I did six miles at this pace. I can I can definitely go faster than that for 2.4 miles. So use this time like to get really good and really confident in open water swimming. And that I, I don't think we're ever, 
I hope we never get the opportunity like this. I don't think we're ever going to get an opportunity like this again where a race season gets pushed almost an entire year, where you have an entire year to kind of just have fun and enjoy swimming, um, which I know is very hard for a lot of triathletes. Like if you don't come from a swim background, it's not natural and it doesn't feel good and it really stinks to be bad at something. But now you have four months that you can swim because you can lower your bike and run volume if there's no races to really focus on. So some of you will have races that you're training for, but I, I mean, I've told all my athletes, like you let's, let's, let's do something big. Like let's do a big goal. You want to do a six mile swim. Let's do a six mile swim. And you can do social distancing with a six mile swim. You have a kayaker and you have you and they throw food to you. And that's it. I mean, six miles is honestly only a couple hours of swimming. I mean, it's, three, four hours if you're a slower swimmer. It's under two, you know, it's maybe two to three hours if you're moderate to faster. And if you're a professional, it's under two hours. But I doubt, I doubt any of you are. You'd probably be giving this talk if you are versus listening to it. Um, I'm not doing that. I do it. It's like two and a half hours for me. But when you tell people, oh, yeah, I've done a 10K, like that's a marathon swim, you know, that's, you can say, oh, I'm a marathon swimmer now. That'd be pretty cool, and it's probably something you never considered. So think about that. Um, <clears throat> let's see. What else do I have to talk about? We talked about getting back into training a bit. Start slow. Forget about where you left off pace-wise. Okay, that kind of goes with the ego thing. You've been out of the water two, three, four months. You're not going to be as fast right now, but that doesn't mean you won't be as fast or if not faster in two months. Um, so just kind of get rid of the pace thing, focus on feeling good, having fun and focusing on your technique. Um, and then after a few weeks, just, you've built up a little bit of base, then you can start adding some intensity, 80, 90% of max effort, a few 95% short sprints to end a workout. Just like you do a track workout, you might do some strides or some 50, 50 or hundred yard sprints. Same thing, open water and your workout just to get that heart rate up a little bit. At the very end, maybe do a couple 50-yard, 100-yard sprints, call it a day. Um, but I would focus more on the stroke technique and the open water skills. Um, so we'll talk briefly about open water skills, unless people have questions about getting back into training. Any questions? Three, two, I'll let you type a little faster. Okay. I guess everyone's a professional swimmer. Um, okay, open water skills. The number one most important skill. <clears throat> Does anyone know what it is? All right, I'm going to give you 30 seconds. That might be too long. Put in what you think your, your, the most important open water skill is. You have 15 seconds. There's no wrong answers. There's just one best answer. Wow. No one has... All right, it's sighting, okay? It's sighting. And I'm sure you're all gonna say, oh yeah, I was gonna say that, but you did it. So uh, sighting is the most important. Why is it the most important? Well, when you're in a pool, you follow the black line. When, the open, when you're in the open water, oh, there we go, Amy got it. Um, so when you are in the open water, especially in ponds, um, Yes, breathing is important. Very good. Yes, we do need to know how to breathe. All right. I guess I'm just a little bit further ahead on the, on the talk. Never swim alone, yes. Uh, not an open water skill. Um, so sighting is most important because you're not following a black line and you are not following the person in front of you, okay? I, I can't, I can't, like, never follow the person in front of you. And here's why. I'll tell you a story. I was at Pumpkin Man Festival, I don't know, when I used to do triathlon a long time ago. And I was leading the swim. And the sun got in my eyes, and I, I may have gone off course. Who else went off course? The entire race behind me. I took them into the middle of the course because I couldn't find the buoy, but everyone was sighting off me, and no one was sighting on the actual buoys. So... Just because someone is in front of you doesn't mean they swim in a straight line or know where they're going. So you should focus on your sighting and what you're seeing and picking your, nat your, your I guess, track or trajectory. Um, so with sighting, 
there's no real wrong way to do it. There's a more efficient way to do it. Um, so I'm going to demonstrate. You'll have to imagine that I'm in water. So there's a couple ways I like to do it. Um, the one thing that does stay the same is you're going to want to cite every three to four stroke cycles or every six to eight strokes. Uh, the reason for this is because if you go 10, 15, 20 strokes, and your right arm is stronger or crosses over, that means you're going to be not on course and God knows where you'll be. Um, so with every six to eight, you're going to catch yourself from going off course pretty quickly. So with sighting, um, there's a few techniques. Some people see snake eyes. I think if you are in a pond uh, or the ocean is flat, or you're swimming by yourself and there's no one splashing in front of you, that like snake eyes just kind of get in your eyes, your nose out. That's great because you can kind of see where you're going. When you sight, you want, especially when you do a race, you want to kind of do some course recon and be like, okay, there's a big tree over there and there's nothing else. So I'm going to sight to the tree, not the buoy. Uh, oh, there's some power lines over there. I'm going to sight to that when I go left. And then I have the big, you know, and swim finish sign and I'll sight to that when I'm going in. Uh, so you want to sight to big markers, not little things on the water, because if the sun gets in your eye, it's going to be a lot harder to see the little buoy than the massive, you know, 100-foot tree. Uh, but when we sight, so I personally don't want to breathe when I sight. I don't think you want to breathe when you sight, because it's going to throw off the rhythm of your stroke. So when I'm sighting, okay, I'm swimming, I got to sight. I'm going to breathe, okay, so I breathe before I sight, and then I'm just going to turn the head and look forward. Okay, so my eyes, nose, whatever, it's out of the water. I've got my breath. I look forward. I like to do two strokes. So one to figure out where I am, two to make a correction, and then I go back to swimming. Some people like that. Some people don't. If you don't like that, you can breathe. You turn, you sight, and then you put your head down. So you do one stroke, and then if you need to sight again, okay, got a correct course, sight one more time. So you can do it as many times as you need to in a row without it tiring you out, tiring you out because it's not like... I'm, I'm coming way up out of the water and working really hard to lift my entire body out. So I prefer the method where I breathe on both ends because I breathe every three strokes and I don't want to mess up my breathing rhythm. So I'll breathe, I'll do two or three strokes, and then I turn and breathe on the way out. Okay, so it's breathe, two or three strokes, figure out where I'm going, make corrections, and then breathe, head back in, and I'm in my rhythm. So that's what I like to do. But even if you're just swimming and it's picking your head up, as long as you're looking where you're going and you're navigating, that will hopefully keep you on course because we, if you're in a race, you want to swim the distance the race is, not a half mile more or a quarter mile more because you weren't paying attention to where you were going. Uh, in just swimming for fun, I mean, I don't, I'll, I'll sight. I don't really care if I go off course that much because I'm not racing. I'm just trying to get some swims in and have some fun. So... Um, sighting is the most important skill. Uh, if you have friends, you can practice drafting. Um, drafting is always a fun skill. Practice being on their feet, working your way up to the hips, and then kind of almost like you would attack on the bike. Do the same thing when you're swimming so you can work on drafting. If there's buoys, you can also work on turns. But nailing those skills now is especially sighting. Sighting is the one skill you can never be too good at. Because if there's waves, if there's different conditions, you need to learn, oh, I'm, a wave's coming, I need to duck dive down, or, oh, it's just like, a, it's not a like wave cresting, it's just kind of a little swell, oh, I'm going to make sure I sight at the top. Because if I sight in the middle of the valleys, or the, yeah, the peaks, and I'm in the valley, I'm not going to see anything. I'm going to see the next, you know, bit of water. So I want to kind of feel for the water, oh, I'm going up, okay, I'm at... I'm higher than everything. I can see everything a lot easier. So you can never do too much sighting because it's not just about doing the actual motions. It's about feeling what's going around, going on around you and knowing like, oh, now's not a great time to sight because I can feel the pull of a wave. I'm going to wait. Or I can, you know, I can feel I'm going down. I'm going to, I'm going to wait. Or, oh, I'm going up. I should sight right now. So it's practicing sighting is practicing situational sighting, not just the act of physically picking your head up, putting it down. Um, so I'd say really work on that. Some, some drills you can do to get stronger with it in the open water. You can do sculling. So you just have your hands out front and just kicking and getting your head up, keeping your head up the whole time. It's going to work on your traps and your back. So you build up some of that strength. 
also water polo drill or Tarzan swimming or head up swimming. So your head's up the whole time. This is a good drill because you can, you're going to build up strength, but you can also kind of watch your hands entering, making sure you're going in fingertips first, entering farther in front of you, not crossing over, not entering like you do in the YMCA. So um, those are some of the drills you can definitely do. Let's see. So we've talked about sighting and some open water skills. Along with that, um, and using this time for really getting good at swimming, I would highly recommend, if you can and you feel comfortable with it, is hiring a swim coach. Um, and I would highly recommend a coach who has... Um, is a USA swimming coach, a, a, a US Masters coach, um, a, a USA triathlon coach with an extensive swim background. Um, because there's so much technique, you want someone who knows what they're talking about. But hiring them in the sense of helping you with the open water. Okay, so it's going to be a different set of drills. Uh, if you're new to triathlon or you're new to swimming, I mean, if you're in a pond, a coach, a coach can teach you how to swim in a pond. So, um, or, or, really like a, a really protected bay as well um so i think it's and now is like a perfect time to do it uh one because you've been off for a few months if not longer so some of those bad habits haven't snuck their way back in quite yet so um a coach is really going to kind of help you nip those in the bud so they don't come back you can kind of break them now while your muscle memory is a little bit I guess weaker and forgot some of the bad habits you created last uh, last season. So there's a really great time for that. And you have, like I said, you have the whole year to get really, 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 really good at swimming, right? Um, like with no races, with no time goals stuck in your head, like, oh, I have to hit this pace. I, I have to do that distance. Like that goes out the window and you can really focus on getting good at swimming and really enjoying it. And I think if you keep an open mind, you work with a coach and you learn to enjoy swimming, that's when you get faster. You don't get faster when you free, you dread it. Like you go to the ocean, oh, I have to swim, this sucks. Like hopefully none of you are saying that after two months of not being able to swim in a pool, right? Um, go in, open mind, have fun, be safe. And, um, and yeah, I mean, work on the technique and have fun. I mean, have fun. That's the most important thing. So I think there was a question a while back. So we got like 13, 14 minutes. So I think I will stop talking about things I want to talk about. And I'm going to talk about things you want to hear about. So let's see. Someone had a question. I'm scrolling. I think it was about swimming. Have a race late July. How to ramp up. Um, so again, this is, it depends. <laughs> depends on the distance. Depends on your ability um, and depends where you're left off. If you've been swimming, how many days a week you're going to swim. I think if you're going to ramp up, you swim two to four times a week for the next couple weeks. Don't worry about distance. Just get in. Uh, start feeling good. Start adding in the, um, some speed work, but really, I mean, there's no reason to go more than 90% of max effort at this point. Um, if, if it's like a long race, it's hard to say without knowing what your current training is and what you're training for. But let's say you can swim. You, last summer you did a half Ironman and you're training for a half Ironman. Between now and the end of July, you have plenty of time to ramp up. Um, I would say get in the next two weeks, feel good, see where you're at with, okay, a mile and a half. So, yeah, if you are swimming – I would say three times a week. If it feels good, you can get a fourth in, you know, after the next two weeks, build in a fourth, uh, swimming anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour and a half, depending on what you're going to work on that time. You know, it could be a fast 30 minutes tempo effort swim, or it might just be a long swim for distance. Uh, but I, I would probably say, depending on your technique, 10 to 20% increase in volume week over week. Uh, and that can be either by adding a swim or attacking on a little more to each swim. Once you have your base, you can focus more on a little bit more on speed, top end speed, switching up the gears. Um, but also remember, like, don't get super caught up in that because everyone's in the same boat as you as far as training goes. So everyone's going to go in 
probably slower than they did last year. So don't compare yourself this year where you've had three additional months of training to, or last year we had three months, three months of training that you missed this year and expect to be faster. I hope you're faster. And I think it's doable depending on some of the other things you did, like your nutrition and if you gained weight or you didn't gain weight during the little break and how much you were doing uh, dry land and other things. So, uh, but I think 10% is the rule of thumb um, just to prevent injury. But again, if you have good technique, you can definitely do it a bit faster week over week. I usually wouldn't recommend over 20% increase week over week. And I wouldn't start doing speed work till you've done at least two to three weeks of base training. Uh, Andy asked, uh, oh, hopefully that answered your question, Sam. Um, I'm weary of swim coaches who haven't done or watched a triathlon. Uh, I would agree. Um, I am of the mindset that you, it's hard for a coach to understand what goes on if they haven't done an event. And that doesn't mean like if you haven't done like an Ironman, you shouldn't, if, you, if you're a coach who hasn't done Ironman, you shouldn't coach Ironman. That's not what I mean by it because the, the theory and coaching athletes is different. But from a swim perspective, like it's very hard to describe to someone what taking a hit feels like or what might happen uh, getting bumped or what happens in like the whole washing machine of a start. If you haven't done it, even watching it, I don't think is enough. But if you've done an open water swim, that is enough to, um, you know, give them a, a, a reference point or a benchmark of like, okay, if this happens, it's going to feel like this is what's going to happen. Try not to do these three things. Keep going. Um, so I, I tend to agree a bit with uh, what you're saying, Andy. Um, like, for example, I when I started doing channel swimming, I didn't want to coach myself. I needed the accountability, but I didn't want to be coached by someone who had never done a long marathon swim because they have no idea what my body or what it's going to feel like at hour 12, you know, of a 15 hour swim and what to do and how to get through it mentally. So I like having coaches who also, I don't need them to be top performers that I don't care about because not everyone's born with the ability. I need to be a good coach who has experienced like that fatigue or experienced like getting hit in a swim or someone pulling my ankles and, and pulling you under like that experience can only really be taught if it's happened to someone. Um, so I like to find people who have had those experiences, but I don't need them to be the best athlete. I want to be the best coach. And I think that's a lot of, it's a trap. A lot of people fall into. It's like, I don't want the professional triathlete coaching me. I want the professional triathletes coach to be coaching me. That's how I look at things with swimming. So Hopefully that helps. Uh, Margaret, what is better to build? What is better to build up? Add a day at same distance or add more distance and keep same number of days? Um, it depends. It depends what you're training for. Um, and it depends on your schedule. I think they're both good. I think when you build up days, you're going to end up having better technique to a point um, versus building up distance. And the reason I say that is because if you if you never get past, say you only do some 30 minutes five days a week or four days a week and you add another 30 minutes swim, your body's tired the next day, but it's not exhausted, right? But if you swim 30 minutes and then you go up to 45 minutes, now your body's kind of in a zone where it's like, oh, I haven't been here before. I'm going to start learning like the muscular endurance and what I need to do and what it feels like, how to deal with the fatigue if there is any, do I have to speed up, back off? So I think there's benefits to both. I think when you're in base phase, it's going to be slightly better to add the day versus the day at same distance. But as you get into closer to like the season, um, I think it's better to either take away or start building up the distance like within the day itself. Uh, just because then your technique doesn't fall apart after 30 minutes, right? You get really good at swimming 30 minutes, but you can't swim 31 minutes. That's not helpful unless your event is going to be 30 minutes or less, in which case you can probably get away with either or because it's such a short amount of time swimming. Um, does that answer your question? I hope. Any more questions? we got a few more minutes. But hopefully this is helpful to a lot of you. I know it's a lot of talk about safety. Um, 
it's dangerous out there. I mean, I'm not trying to deter you from it. I don't, you know, you can be the best room in the world, the worst room in the world, and it's can be equally dangerous at certain times. Um, so, you know, one thing I will, you know, say is, and I think Yandy brought it up, you guys have sharks and, and the Cape, which is definitely true. Um, I think becoming educated about where you swim is really important. You know, I know, like we have sharks in the North Shore, definitely less of them because we don't have seals. But I know if I'm not swimming where there's seals, I'm not swimming during feeding times, my chances of an incident are far less. I also know some beaches have more jellyfish than other beaches. So knowing the environment or the, your couple swim sites and what you could experience um, are really helpful. I mean, even with waves, I swim at some places where the contour of the beach is more conducive to big swell. And then I swim in other places where a white cap only happens if there's wind and we're talking about about six inches of, 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 of wave. So knowing the environment you're going to swim into will help you decide what you need to do as far as safety goes, as far as what kind of workout you're going to get in. Um, but uh, another thing, just briefly, that I like to do, especially if you want to work on entries, exits, and getting your heart rate up, I love doing workouts where, <clears throat> and this this is, I would only do this with a coach in the water usually, um, or somebody that I'm doing it with, but I will do, uh, basically run into the water, duck dive, take about 20, 30 hard strokes, turn right, swim for about, uh, you know, 30, 60, 100 strokes, hard turn in and then basically sprint in run up and then basically run up the beach um that way i'm getting my re my heart rate up i'm working on sighting i'm watching all these different things so um I, I like that workout a lot and you get a ton of distance in and you get a great workout uh karen asks what do you eat on a 10k swim um personally i every 30 minutes i will have about 200 to 250 calories of either Carbo Pro, which is like a carbohydrate uh, drink, or 250 calories of Goo Roctane drink. Um, and I keep it all liquid. But you can eat whatever you want, whatever you like. Um, that's generally what I do. Uh, that's what I do for my marathon swims as well. And then I'll do like a Cliff Bar every three hours, an Advil at hour four, eight. And you come up with all these crazy plans. But I've seen people who eat jelly munchkins during their English channel swims. So you can eat what you want. <laughs> uh, just think about when you're swimming, if you get seasick or if you're going to swallow a lot of salt water by accident, what you want coming up. Because I prefer liquids coming up than jelly donuts. So personal preference. Um, but yeah, so thank you all for watching. I hope it was helpful. Uh, if you're looking for a coach, I think Trish is a coach. Uh, if you're on the Cape, if you're on the North Shore, Boston area, uh, you can check out my site, liquidtry.com, L-I-Q-U-I-D-T-R-I.com. Uh, if you have any ever, ever, if you ever have any questions, feel free to email me. I am happy to answer questions. Um, yeah, and I hope you are all staying safe with all the stuff going on, but also in the open water. So I, with that, I will end it. Thank you for having me. Bye bye.